If we try to bring up an example of a truly living person, Abraham may answer, for he was just that. His most important value was love for God. That is why there was future for his soul. That is why many peoples originated from him. Jesus Christ also had a living soul. To him, love was more important than even morality. Love has no rigid form, whereas morality has always the shape of some rules and conventions. Present-day Europe is dying, just as Israel had been dying decades before its physical dissolution. Rules are becoming more important than feelings, technical progress more important than morals. What they now call correctness is nothing but deadly negligence towards the crucial and the essential in the core of all processes. All is sacrificed to keep the useless ossified form intact. Any person usually becomes kinder before the face of death. The same must apply to societies. They must also become kinder. Kinder societies may be given certain people who value love highest and who can resuscitate their soul through love. Jesus Christ appeared in the dying state Israel, and that was quite logical. Presentiments of death may turn a society to God just as any one person, and then their subconscious priorities change. The elderly professor becomes kinder when premonitions of his death appear. His fate sends him some fellow travelers, a young girl with two friends. Looking at them, he suddenly feels that it is not only his body that has grown old, but his soul too. He suddenly realizes that he has been living not by love, but by principles and rules. Feeling that his death is close at hand, he returns to such concepts as love, mercy, sacrifice, and forgiveness. And at parting, the young girl unexpectedly declares, Of the two boyfriends of mine, I choose you. You are the better man. Though strange, the story is quite probable. When the professor was young, smart, handsome, and lively, somehow women did not like him. They dumped him for other men. And now the dying, dilapidated, and weary old man snatches a love confession from a young and beautiful woman. And the reason why it happens is love that he suddenly feels and learns to cling to, unlike the two young men near. What happened is resurrection of a soul. It is not likely to restore Professor's personal future. Rejuvenation and health are not probable. He will die in the nearest future, most likely. But his soul has been saved brought to life by divine energy flowing in it once more. This fact instantly influences the condition of his son. The son suddenly turns from an insulated, cold and depressive person into a loving man. Just recently, on finding out that his wife was pregnant, he confronted her with an ultimatum. It is either me or the child. His decision to force his wife's abortion was categorical and peremptory. And here we have the scene of the father and son meeting. You owe me money, says the old professor. You may keep it. And his son says that he loves his wife and wants to stay with her even though she refuses to procure abortion. It means that the child has some life in it. His future has been restored. And the reason why it all could happen is the old professor's resurrected soul. The body can do without a resurrection, but not so the soul. It wants to be resuscitated continually. The brilliant Bariman was given the chance to witness his prophetic presentiments come true while he was still alive. He was there to see the slow dimming and fading of Europe. But the film leaves the impression that Barman knew that salvation could be assumed.
A peaceful summer evening in the south of France. I look at my watch. Surprisingly, I feel better with every moment, even though I have been driving for about 12 hours. My condition, as far as I can feel it, would have allowed me to cover a distance twice as long as I already have. And I see the road clearly still, regardless of the darkening sky. And by the way, why is my eyesight getting weaker? Well, some reasons are clear. Unhealthy lifestyle and nutrition. I also get serious overstrains in my work. But I think the chief factor here is problems with my soul. For many years, I've had a habit of thinking ill of people, just to justify them later on. And I have always been a proponent of stringent measures. Now I understand why. For me, principles have been more important than love and mercy. My innermost foundation was badly listed off and healed over towards the realm of spirit. I lived by extremes, and this goes to show that I had problems with my soul. Now that I understand that soul is at the base of any human concept, as well as any human being and all that lives, everything has become clear. Everything is in its proper place. To be able to move the main foundation from the future, that is, spirit, onto soul, we must provide normal conditions for the soul to function. These conditions are our correct world perception and attitude, as well as nutrition and lifestyle in general. Someone who perceives the world from a spiritual or bodily standpoint sees everything as static and unprogressing. But only he who lives by his heart and soul sees the world as flowing, changing and developing. Again, someone who places mind and reason highest perceives the world as unchanging. And if something falls out of his rigid, stable concepts, he is inclined to destroy those things as threatening his perfect systematic worldview. That is why a person with overly intensive pride is always inwardly aggressive. He becomes truly happy, not through loving, uniting and helping others, but through superiority, suppression of others and self-glorification. Such people are only satisfied to be at the center of attention. They will have nothing less than the whole universe spinning around them. It is a widely known fact that for many centuries of the Christian era, the geocentric model of the world was deemed to be true. This model, where Earth was taken to be the center of the universe, indicated parochialism and narrowness of view. Someone living by his love and soul understands that the world can be changed, and that allows us to speak in terms of teaching and changing our offenders, not destroying or suppressing them. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, said Christ. Peacemakers are living souls that have much love and energy. They feel incessantly united with everyone. Generally, the nine blessings given by Christ describe people with well-developed souls. Who are the blessed poor in spirit? How do you distinguish those who care not for the moral? <clears throat> and the answer is love and soul that have become for them more important than the reasoning mind or the future. If someone is not bright or clever, he may be devoid of the nearest future. But love, soul and honor will always make him strategically stronger to survive and win in the end. Happy is he who values soul higher than spirituality, for it is in the soul that love dwells. And happiness is nothing else than acquiring love and constantly increasing it inside the soul. Somehow my thoughts begin to pursue the subject of nutrition once more. 
Interesting, think I. Traveling on the roads of France sets me thinking mostly about food and drink. <laughs> the local aura, I expect. As a proverb puts it, God created food, devil trained the cooks. Our defective style of thinking makes us either worship food or treat it as an evil to keep away and abstain from. The canons of Indian philosophy are both dialectic and simple in that respect. Food must be fresh. Food must cheer the eye and create a pleasant mood. One must take food in while being in a good disposition. One should eat after one's bowels have been emptied. One must only eat if one is hungry. I try to recall the head principles of Vedic nutrition, but cannot at the moment bring them to mind. The Dale followers, whose philosophy overlaps the Indian, say that one should eat little. However, periodically one must allow oneself to eat and drink profusely, to put the organism to a healthy shock, and to make all the organs work at their full strength. Here we see dialectic approach again. To return once more to the Hunzakut nutrition style, in winter they feed on ground crushed grain cultures, brine cheese from sheep's milk and dried up apricots. The main feature of their healthy nutrition may be the forced springtime fasting period, when they only drink hot stewed fruit water. Such mode of living, with external energetics minimal, necessitates activation of higher inner energy. It passes through soul, which means that the soul should be in a proper condition. We must be cheerful, kind-hearted and lively. The Honsakuts are extraordinarily hospitable and warm towards visitors from other countries. Their elderly generation are treated with explicit respect and reverence. And although they dwell at the height of 2,000 meters above sea level, a 100 kilometers mountain walk is an easy stroll for them. Periodic fasting, backed by cheerfulness and kindness of heart, plus habitual energy outflow as serious physical tasks, all this results in activation of the vitally important higher energy. It is this subtle energy that ensures health and long life. <clears throat> Contrarily, Europeans suppress subtle energy with external energy. High-calorie food with low natural energetics leads to destruction of the subtle energy of soul. Actually, this is reasonably devised. If a human loses loving impulses and longings for God, he must degrade. Otherwise, he will not even realize what he is missing. When divine energy passes through the soul, we feel joy and happiness and experience a sensation of unitedness with the whole world. We feel willing to sacrifice, to take care of others and make them happy. That is why the apostles used to say, rejoice evermore. Someone who is ready to be cheerful, who is orientated on kind-heartedness and high spirits, creates a mode of life that is correct for souls. Strange, I keep on thinking. Why is it then that the tendency for sorrow is so explicitly evident in Orthodox Christianity? <laughs> Why is it necessary to concentrate on one's sinfulness and to repent constantly? Why so little rejoicing? <laughs> Probably because there happened a shift towards the realm of spirit, like the initial shift and Catholicism. And when a person feels his infallible rightness and superiority in regard to others, he will naturally end up counterbalancing this state with its opposite.
That is with self-abasement and sensation of his own imperfection. But if he holds spirit to be the foundation of everything, then sin will lurk at every corner, no matter how hard you may humiliate yourself. <laughs> Maybe it was this practice of overcoming pride through self-abasement that caused oncology in many Christian saints. It is indeed a widespread tendency in Orthodox Christianity to see oneself as terribly sinful and to incessantly repent of one's sins. I try to think about it. What is sin? It is loss of love, loss of unity with God. It is losing the God within your soul. What is then repentance? It means changing oneself to a degree where sinful behavior is firmly left in the past. It means that you irrevocably refuse to be and behave as before. You feel that you simply cannot. Our behavior is linked to our inner state. If we want to change our behavior, we must change our inner world. But concentrating on our sinfulness amounts to concentrating on loss of love, which may result in an even greater decrease in love. If we define sin as loss of love and unity with God, then overcoming sin means restoring love within our soul. As for severe self-reproach and self-abasement, they are of little avail, if at all. How do we lose love for God? This happens because we become more attracted by happy prospects for our soul, spirit, and body. In Hinduism, a concept exists about the three chief origins of sin. They are lust, anger, and greed. Lust is soul's desire for pleasure. Anger is spirit's desire for knowledge, power, and control. Body's greed is easy to see. It is incontinence in one's eating and sexual habits, as well as any habits indeed. It is rampant self-interest and insatiable desire. To overcome sin, we must first of all abstain from pleasures that come through body, spirit, and soul. And secondly, after having reached this condition of dispassionate contemplation, we must reach out for God and feel that this sensation of unity is the highest pleasure of all. It is then that love and joy fill our souls.